Welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for our event, uh, Entertaining Julia Child Style. Today, we're going to be talking with Jacques Pepin and Alex Prudhomme about fun ways to host during the holidays as inspired by Julia Child. I'm Craig Lamolt. I'm a reporter at GBH, and I'm the host for today's event. Don't forget, by the way, to sign up for tomorrow's Ask the Expert event on pie baking, uh, crust us. You don't want to miss this opportunity to make your holidays even sweeter with tips from our pie baking expert, Sarah Belisle. Uh, also want to thank everybody that's joined us today, including our leadership circle and Ralph Lowell Society members. We really appreciate your continued genuine, generous support. Uh, before we get started, I just want to say friendly reminder, unlike us, you're not going to be on video. We can't hear or see you, but we do want to know your questions. If you have a question you want to ask uh, either of our experts, all you have to do is open the Q&A tab, which is at the bottom of your screen, and type that question in. Uh, as always, we'd love to know where you're tuning in from. So when you submit your question, please be sure to let us know where you're watching this event from. And if you see a question that you want to hear the answer to that someone else has asked, give it a thumbs up. This is really important because the questions that get a thumbs up move to the top of the list. And the ones that have the most uh, thumbs up, we're going to make sure to try to get to those questions as well. We'll try to get to all of them. There's a lot of people joining us today. So please give a thumbs up to the questions that you most want the answers to. Also, if you want to turn on the closed captioning feature, all you have to do is click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. You're going to have two uh, display options that are going to pop up. Uh, we recommend you select subtitle. Uh, that gives you uh, captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript and a sidebar window will open up where you can see what each speaker is saying. Uh, bear in mind the closed captioning might be slightly delayed. Um, and without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Jacques Pepin and Alex Prudhomme. Uh, Alex is Julia Child's great nephew, and he's also the co-author of her autobiography, My Life in France. He's the author of The French Chef in America and has also, uh, also authored or co-authored four other books, The Ripple Effect, Hydrofracking, The Cell Game, and Forewarned. Uh, his work has appeared in the New York Times, The New Yorker, and other publications. Alex, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks. Glad to be here. And also want to welcome, of course, Jacques Pempin. He is the winner of 16 James Beard Awards and a Daytime Emmy Lifetime Achievement Award. He's the author of 29 cookbooks, including his latest, which is Jacques Pempin, Quick and Simple. Uh, he has starred in 12 acclaimed PBS cooking series, and was awarded France's highest distinction, the Legion of Honor. Jacques Pepin, thank you so much for, for being here. Well, I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you. I didn't do all of this. Uh, some of <laughs> you did it all. It's quite a long list of achievements. And you know, I, one of the things that you've done uh, that is, I think, something we're all very jealous of, is that you spent a lot of time in the kitchen with Julia Child. And you know, from watching the two of you together, it, it looks like it was a lot of fun. And I'm just wondering if you can start off by sharing some of your favorite memories of, of what it was like to, to be in the kitchen with her. Well, you know, I met Julia, I came here in 1959. <clears throat> I met Julia in the spring of 1960. So I knew her for basically half a century. And uh, so we, before we did show together, I mean, I saw her many of very often in one place or another. At some point, I've been teaching at BU at Boston University for 37 years now. So like, uh, well, 37 years ago, I went to BU and I went to see, of course, each time I went to Boston, I went to see Julia. We had breakfast, lunch, or dinner together. And eventually we, we start teaching together at BU. So we did what they call cooking in concert that was before the Food Channel Network to a very large crowd of like hundreds of people. And that led to the series that we eventually did on television. So that's how, but as I said, uh, we had a, a great time cooking together. Uh, often what people don't realize is that uh, we had no recipe when we did those, uh, those shows. So uh, it took over two years by the time we finished the series to come on the air because Knopf Random House was doing a book, but you know there was no recipe, we didn't have a manuscript. So they would call Julia on me, what did you do in that show? How much flour did you put in there? Like if I remember two years later, <laughs> you know, especially we didn't measure too much. So uh, it took a long time, it was a different way of doing it, but 
maybe more in tune with the way you cook with a, with a spouse or with a friend in the kitchen. You know, why did I put scallion in that dish? Because they happened to be on the table. And so I put the scallion in it or whatever it was, uh, because we didn't have a recipe. And also another thing which was very important, I did 13 series of 26 show for KQED, the PBS station. And all of the series that I did, the beginning, 30 minutes on PBS was like 28, 29 minutes of cooking. And they said, okay, we want to be on time because editing is very expensive. So someone would go with a sign, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, three minutes, one minute, wrap up, which could be pretty stressing. So yeah. we started changing when I did it with my, my daughter, but we want a few minutes of the time that was fine. When we did it with Julia, Julia said, we are going to cook. When it's finished, we'll tell you. We, I think the longest show we did was 110 minutes you know, for a 30 minute show. So, you know, no recipe, a bottle of wine, no time frame, but we had a good time. You know? Yeah, and, yeah. And, it, and it works. And, and I'm sure what came out was delicious. And, and it was certainly a lot of fun for us to watch it for sure too. Alex, I just want to, you know, you grew up having Thanksgiving dinner with Julia, which must have been incredible. Can, can you tell us a little bit about how, how she did Thanksgiving? And, and I will say one thing I've heard, one of my favorite details about this has to do with the telephone. Yeah, well, so Julia and Paul lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts in a big old gray house right behind uh, Harvard. And uh, my family lived in New York. We would often go up to Cambridge for Thanksgiving or they would come visit us. Um, and um, Julia uh, insisted on keeping her phone number in the phone book. And so you'd be there on Thanksgiving day and she would put us all to work. Um, you know, she'd say, now you wash the lettuce and, and you uh, get the bread and you go down to the basement with Paul and get the wine um, and I'll work on the turkey. Um, and we'd be all working and the phone would ring and it would be some stressed out person uh, whose uh, turkey was uh, incinerating in their stove and they didn't know what to do and they called Julia and she would talk them down out of their stress um, very calmly and she, she'd say, you know, it, it doesn't have to be perfect all the time. I'm sure it'll be just fine. And that was the message people really wanted to hear. And it was great. And, 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 um, and these people didn't great. know her. They just picked up the phone book and yeah. said, let's call yeah, Julia yeah. Child. No, they were desperate. <laughs> it was uh, the Julia helpline. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, she was very inclusive. She, we all cooked, we all ate, uh, we all did the dishes together. Um, uh, and it was just a whirlwind. It was fun. What about the meal? Like, what did, what did she do? Was it really traditional? Well, did she? So I have to give you a little background here. So Julia loved to eat birds of all kinds. Um, when they lived in France in the 50s, uh, this season was is game bird season. Mm -hmm. And so um, people from the countryside would bring in quail and partridge and duck from the countryside. And she loved that. Uh, and when she was learning to cook um, at the Cordon Bleu, uh, her professor there, Max Bougnard, uh, uh, taught her some little tricks about how to get some tough parts out of a pheasant's leg, for example. Um, and she loved those little trucs. Um, uh, she, she, she always thought of chicken as a, as a great um, comfort food. And she would say, um, you know, you can really judge a cook by their chicken. It's a seemingly simple dish, um, but you can get it wrong in a million different ways. Yeah, and yeah. if someone's a, a real good cook, they will get their roast chicken done well. Um, she, uh, she loved Turkey uh, in the States, but when they were transferred um, in the diplomatic service from France to Germany, they were in, in the US uh, embassy area there in, in Plittersdorf, Germany. And there was a big storeroom full of rancid turkey. And the smell so disgusted her that she said she couldn't eat turkey for a decade after that. Wow. <laughs> All right. Um, and had bad associations. But then finally, they moved back. They retired from the diplomatic service. They moved back to the States. And um, she, she took up turkey again with great enthusiasm. Um, and so when we ate as a family, we we're all love to cook. Uh, we're a foodie family. And there was a kind of a, an unspoken competition 
uh, or performance art about who could do what sort of side dish. Mm -hmm. um, so we would have- I like that it was a competition. Well, it's, you know, the, the French uh, say that, that good cooking is a combination of high art and competitive sport. And I think that's how our family treats it. Uh, Jacques, and, would you say that's right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, 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 that's true. And um, so we would do things, uh, Julia would generally do the turkey, uh, but, but we would uh, do things like uh, not one, but three different kinds of cranberry sauce or cranberry chutney. Mm -hmm. um, Julia loved a stuffing with oysters in it, which was very mm. rich. And I remember eating too much of it one year and feeling not so good afterwards. Yeah, moderation. Um, and then the one thing I'll never forget is she made a pumpkin soup that she served in a real pumpkin, a giant pumpkin, mm. which was like 90% cream. Um, and pumpkins, you know, kind of spun together with mm. some other flavors in there. And uh, I remember her saying, um, well, you, you can leave some of the cream out but you'll be sorry. <laughs> so it was that kind of thing. We would, uh, you know, we would just had a great time. I'm realizing that scheduling this conversation at lunchtime may have been a mistake because I'm just going to be really thinking about all of this food that you're describing. Uh, you know, Jacques, I wanted to, you, I, I'm, I'm guessing uh, that you did not grow up in a household that celebrated American Thanksgiving. I'm going to, I'm going to take a wild guess that that was not yeah. part of your, but I'm wondering if yeah. you've adopted it, right? I mean, do you, do you, what do you think of this meal that we have every year? Uh, and uh, is it something that, that you make? And, uh, or do you have a, a Thanksgiving meal? And what do you have? Well, we, I've been in America so long. Um, you know, much more American certainly than French now. But uh, yes, you're absolutely right. Thanksgiving did not exist in France. But for me, Thanksgiving is the greatest the greatest of all American, uh, American celebration. And the reason is that there is no uh, uh, date of uh, some type of battle where uh, thousands of people were killed to celebrate. There is no church uh, mad that because it's uh, whatever church thing that may be too. There is nothing of this. It's purely to get together to eat and drink. And for me, that's perfect. So yes, I have absolutely adopted Thanksgiving as my greatest holiday, you know. And every year we do celebrate it. This year we are going to be like 18 or, or 20 people. Nice. So nice. What, do you, were, what do you cook? Well, of course, turkey. Uh, uh, I'm going to do mashed potato with, with garlic and uh, sweet potato. Uh, we're going to do, uh, to do uh, the uh, Brussels sprout. We're going to do... Uh, uh, from apple pie to apple gallet, you know, the difference and so forth. But uh, I remember if I may say when I was with Julia cooking, uh, at some point she wanted to do a turkey. She said, we got to do that for Thanksgiving. I said, okay, fine, great. And she said, I, I want you to bone out the turkey and serve the breast separate with the leg. I said, I don't want to do that. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah, and eventually, of course. She remember that we did the show with Julia. At the beginning, she asked me, why don't you write down what you want to do? Like 80, 100 dishes, which I did. And she did the same thing. And I think five of my dishes made it on the whole series. <laughs> so, so the point, I said, okay, so we bought out the turkey. So take the two legs out and the breast separate and to cook it. And I said, okay, after she said, I want you to bone out the, the, the thigh. We're gonna stuff it with actually, I think we did oyster and cornbread, uh, which we wrap up together. And we cook the, the breast uh, with the leg around and carrot, onion too, uh, in a totally different way. And uh, uh, I think it's in the book that we did. And then we slide that on the, on the dishes with the natural juice that we made with carrot, onion too. So it ended up being uh, actually quite different and uh, very good. Amazing. I'm, I'm guessing that's not how you're doing it this year. This is not no, the way I have been learned how to do a turkey or, or that I do it normally. But that, uh, yeah. that was, was different. That sounds amazing. We I have. Was, hold on. There was a, yeah. That reminds me that in, in 1978, uh, Julia and Jacques did a similar dish uh, using, a, I think, a chicken on the Tom Snyder show. Uh, and right before they went on air, Julia lopped off the end of her finger, 
uh, and uh, asked Snyder not to mention it, but of course the camera zoomed in and he said, Julia, you know, tell me about your finger. Uh, and she said, oh, well, I cut it. And so Jacques continued and made the dish um, and she had to go get stitches later. But Dan Aykroyd saw that and yeah. turned it into his famous skit uh, about, uh, you know, save the liver. Um, which Julia thought was hilarious, but it all began at, with a Thanksgiving um, uh, a chicken, I think it was. That's, I'm glad to hear that you thought it was hilarious. I know the sketch, I, like, of course, seen Dan Aykroyd do it, and I had no idea it was based on, a, on, on real events uh, that happened. That's amazing. You can, we have, have Jacques, uh, we have a, you can blame Jacques and his knife for that. <laughs> and sharp, have sharp knife. knives. <laughs> and when, when, we, when the, she cut the end of her finger, I push it back together and wrap it with a, with a towel. And, uh, and Tom Snyder was crazy. He said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And Julia said, we're not going to do anything. I don't want to talk about it. Chuck is going to cook. I'll taste with Tuck. And as you know, Paul said, the first thing that Tom, Tom Snyder said, do you mind if we talk about uh, your finger? So that was it. So she ended up being on the Johnny Carson show uh, the, uh, two days later. And she was, we were together on the Catherine Grasby show. Uh, in San Francisco a few days later too, we were supposed to do the demonstration of omelet. All we ended up was talking about a finger. <laughs> and I have to say, by the time we finished that show, we went to the hospital. She got about three or four, five, six sutures, wow. I forget. And then we went to uh, L'Hermitage, uh, Jean Bertrandou until three o'clock in the morning, drinking champagne and eating. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. She knew how to have a good time. That's a great recovery. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> We have a ton of great questions. And I want to really get to them because uh, we, we have a huge audience and they're asking amazing questions. So I'm just going to jump in right here. Um, Wendy wants to know, when do you use sea salt, kosher salt, and regular salt? And what's the difference between the three? Well, the question is for me. Uh, well, let's start with you. Yeah. Better okay, you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you use like fleur de sel, very special core salt, it's very expensive. You would use that to put on top of a dish to finish it up. You don't want to put it in water to cook spaghetti, it melts and uh, you pay five times the price for quality yeah. salt. Otherwise, I like personally kosher type salt uh, because the granulated texture works fine and so forth. But Julia did not, she liked, uh, she liked just regular salt. So we always argue on this. And I actually end up uh, at some point, for 10 years I had, I had a, a colony in the New York Times and I was using kosher salt and I ended up using regular salt, as Julia told me, because uh, I did the experience the other day I, because people were asking me about that. I said, here is a tablespoon of kosher salt. And I put it in the coffee grinder that I do. And I end up with two teaspoons of regular salt. So when I use uh, the, the, the kosher salt and it was a teaspoon, people put a teaspoon of regular salt because they say salt is salt. And of course, it was always too salted. So I end up cutting it down and uh, putting it on uh, doing regular salt when I was doing article and even book now, I always put regular salt unless there is a reason why I would mm -hmm. use another salt because as I say, it does make a difference. But it, it sounds like it is a matter of personal taste, right? And even you and Julia yeah, disagreed on it. Yeah. yeah Alex, do you have any, anything to add on the salt issue? I, I'm uh, totally in alignment. Um, I would just add that that a fleur de sel is really nice to have uh, on the table, and it's something that I'm willing to spend money for. But I'm very careful about how I use it. Um, uh, but as Jacques says, uh, you know, just for cooking, regular salt is the way to go. Okay, Amy from uh, Rollingsford, New Hampshire, uh, says I watched Julia and Jacques create a turkey during one of their wonderful cooking in concert collaborations. She wants to know, uh, what was Julia's favorite holiday meal? Paul, do you know that? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I, you know, it depends on the season. I think um, she would, it, it, she was a very seasonal eater. So, you know, um, Labor Day uh, and 4th of July, we would have sort of picnics. We would either be um, up in Maine or we would be in Cambridge with them um, or at my parents in Connecticut. Um, and we'd do cookouts. Uh, Julia loved to grill um, outside. Um, and um, in the winter, uh, she would tend to have a big stew, a bouffe bourguignon or, a, or some a lamb dish. Um, um, and she loved, uh, she loved fish um, uh, and she loved, as I said, birds of all kinds. Yeah. Um, 
she loved duck. Um, and so, but I think, uh, as Jacques said, uh, for our family, um, Thanksgiving was sort of the ultimate um, holiday. Yeah. Uh, uh, for, because it just was about family and food and drink. And um, at least in our household, it wasn't religious and it wasn't commercial. It was just, just a great time. Um, I actually have a funny story about that. Uh, one year, Paul and Julia came to uh, my parents' house in Connecticut. And they lived on a back country road. And it, if you knew it, uh, it was easy to get there. But Paul, uh, but uh, Julia did not have a good sense of direction. Hmm. And um, so one year they got lost on the way uh, and they stopped at a neighbor's house. And it turned out that our neighbor was in the process of destroying her turkey. Uh, the kitchen was full of smoke. Half the bird was raw, half was burnt. And she was expecting a big crowd of family to come in the door. So she hears a knock on the door <laughs> and she's getting ready to uh, face the wrath of her family as the smoke is billowing out of her kitchen. And, and before she opened the door, she thought to herself, you know, if only Julia Child were here to help me. She opens the door and <laughs> lo and behold, there's St. Julia at the door. And it took her a few minutes to process this in her mind. She's looking at these size 12 sneakers, this brown yeah. skirt, this tall woman, with a very familiar face that was not her sister or not the, the, her uncle. Um, and Julia said, oh, excuse me, uh, do you know where the Prudhommes live? And uh, our neighbor, uh, Mrs. Ali said, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. But before I tell you, you've got to help me with my damn turkey. <laughs> and Julia said, oh, sure, dear. I'd love to help you. And she came in and um, I think she put some tinfoil on the top to keep it from uh, getting blacker than it already was, roasting the sides. She probably took the, 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 the legs and the wings off and roasted them. And, and she said, you know, don't worry about it. It's going to be just fine. Uh, and remember, never apologize uh, for your cooking. Um, and then uh, gave Mrs. Ali a nice uh, shot of red wine to steal her nerves and uh, disappeared into the night. We, we, we were only a half a mile away just down the road, but uh, it was one of those great... Um, legendary stories that uh, that Julia brought for Thanksgiving. That's amazing. It's absolutely amazing to have her <laughs> behind the door. And like, and, and it speaks to, I think, both her like generosity and, and, and her grace, you know, uh, um, about, you know, being able to, being willing to, to share that with her. I mean, I think it speaks to exactly like what she was like. Jacques, Karen uh, says she's been a huge fan of yours always. And she wants to know what your favorite dish is. My favorite dish, uh, uh, deep, I would agree with Julia there in the sense. We always talk about that. Seasonal food is very important. Yeah. You know, in the full summer, when you have a tomato out of the garden, you know, this is where it really tastes good. Secondly, nutritionally, it's probably where, where it's the best for you. And thirdly, maybe more expensive, it's the least expensive. So, you know, seasonal food is going to be cheap the best mm -hmm. for you and testing the best, so why sure. not? So we did uh, follow usually the season. I mean, Julia was very straightforward this way in a sense. Simplicity of recipe, very important. But first, quality of ingredient. Simplicity of recipe, sharing with friends, and the taste certainly uh, take, uh, take precedence over the presentation. You like food presented nicely, but basically uh, we often, take that any food critic should be blind, you know, so that you can refer to the food the way it tastes rather than the way it looks. So, uh, but, you know, Julia was always to have fun in the kitchen and uh, to, to, you know, to be with friends and so forth. But ultimately, after all of that, each time we did a show at the end, she said, okay, what did we teach today? So the mm. teaching element was always very important for her yeah. to show people how to do one thing or another. Yeah, I love that. Um, Jennifer from San Diego, Jacques wants to know what your favorite wine varietal is to serve at Thanksgiving. My favorite what? Your, your favorite wine varietal that you'd like to serve at Thanksgiving. The wine. The wine, oh well, free wine. You know, <laughs> people bring me wine. That, that's my favorite one. Whatever they show up with. What, 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 what do you think pairs well with turkey and all the, the, the sides? 
Well, you know, whatever I have in the cell, I mean, for me, uh, I do enjoy a great, great wine occasionally. But uh, frankly, I'll go to those dinner, uh, uh, degustation dinner, where I have 15 dish and 15 type of wine, where you give you a tablespoon and you have to analyze it. And two, after two of those, two dish, I want to go out and have a taco and a beer somewhere. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so, you know, I like a glass of champagne. Yes, mm -hmm. and a white one and a red one, and that's about it, you know. And in that sense, uh, I uh, eventually may spend money for a special bottle of wine occasionally, but usually I'll pay one between 12 and 20 bucks, something like this. And uh, I will go to a Côte d'Iron, uh, that my type, Beaujolais, I come from there, but Côte, Côte d'Iron, yeah. those kind yeah. of Grenache, Syrah type of wine. But basically, I like any type of wine. I mean, you know, you bring it to me, I'll drink it, you know. Alex, what do you think goes well with Thanksgiving? Uh, I, I'm like a Pinot guy, Pinot Noir, uh, but I love a Cote de Rhone, which is a little heavier uh, as well. Um, I find that the Pinot goes with the side dishes and the salads and so on, um, and is a kind of a, it's a lighter wine. Um, yeah. I, I generally start with a, uh, we, at our table, we usually start with a little champagne and, and um, work our way from from lighter to darker and 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 the evening uh, uh, after we've uh, had too many desserts, uh, you know, with a little cognac or something, um, mm. and make it a kind of a uh, a tasting flight in a way. Um, so that's always a fun part of it for me is is pairing the um, the wines with the food. Um, just back to your previous question, um, Julia and I used to play a game which was. Um, uh, what would you eat uh, if it was your last meal on earth, if you were about yeah. to be executed or something? Uh, <laughs> and um, she would she would change her, her order. Uh, so she never really had like a favorite, but she would do things like she would say, well, we, of course we have to start with champagne and some caviar. Uh, and then it would be a variation. It would either be a, like the sole meunier, which was the first dish she ever ate in France. Um, mm -hmm. uh, when she and Paul arrived in 1948, or um, a duck, not duck à la range, but uh, like a roast duck, like uh, like they do at La Couronne, which was the, the first restaurant she ate at, um, uh, which was, it's in Rouen, and there's a special kind of Rouennaise duck that she loved, um, followed by, uh, you know, a salad verte, a green salad with a delicious fresh baguette and some wonderful butter, um, uh, of course, wine, uh, and then some kind of a dark chocolate uh, or, uh, or uh, a tart tatin, an apple tart for dessert. Um, uh, so uh, it was fun to play with her because she would mix it up and you would think you'd have her nailed down and then she'd change it. So um, that was Julia. <laughs> I, I, would, uh, I would agree. Certainly, uh, Paul, I'm sure, would agree with you and the, and the Pinot Noir because he had a great uh, cellar of uh, very good Burgundy. I remember going in his cellar, it was very good. And also with the duck, I agree with you. I talked to Julia about that, not, not that long ago, you know, before she died, because at that time, when I came to America too, when she was in France, the duck was roasted, just like a chicken. And sometimes with turnips, olive, mm. orange, more known, but all of this, this after, uh, Ariane Dagan or whatever her father introduced Magret, you know, the breast of duck, rare, and the, and the leg, confit to, the whole thing totally disappeared. It's basically impossible now to go to a restaurant and have a roasted duck like a roasted chicken, as it used to be. Yeah. We used to do that at the pavilion when I first came to the, to the U.S., but it basically disappeared. And we were talking about that. Why can't we have a nice roast duck with turnips or something like that? Yes, this would be would be a great dish, especially mm. Long Island duck. I happen to love the Long Island duck. We need to call Daniel Boulud and tell him. <laughs> yeah, right. Get on it. Get on it. God, I love a good roast yeah. duck. Uh, Karen wants to know sauce or gravy and what's the difference? She says a pro chef friend says there's no such thing as gravy. <laughs> well, the difference is the language. One is English, the other one is French. But basically okay. sauce or gravy it can be the same thing. See, that's what happened with language very often. You know, if my mother come here and uh, once she came here and you ask her to do a white sauce, see she didn't speak English, that sounds very complicated, a white sauce. If I told her to do a bechamel, oh yeah, that's fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, sauce gravy is different. I mean, gravy, 
uh, we have the Jew in front, Jew, the natural juice of uh, right. which is uh, of uh, turkey, which is slightly thickened sometimes with a bit of arrowroot, so it's kind of a, a bit gooey. Gravy would tend to be a bit thicker here. More right, you add flour it, it, or something to the, yeah. to the jus. To, or in to the make style it. probably of old French cooking, like Espanol, what we call Espanol, which was a brown stock, thickened with a roux, you know, and cooked for hours, which I used to do when I was in apprentice. So, but basically the same. I mean, it's interchangeable, you know, I think. <laughs> Ma Mary wants to know, did Julia have any guilty pleasures that she liked to eat, like fast food or Twinkies or anything like that? Well, I, I don't have any guilt when it comes to food. I like what I like too. And, uh, uh, I, I, you know, occasionally I love a hamburger, of course. I love pizza. I love, I love basically what all people do and, uh, and, uh, and more. So, uh, yeah, I am a, I'm basically a glutton, you know. So you put it in front of me, I eat it. I used to go to a restaurant with my wife and uh, the chef would know that I'm here and get a bit crazy. Then we order... Uh, whatever she ordered fish and the fish was not that fresh. And I would order that I would eat my fish and I would have to eat her fish, which wasn't particularly good. So the chef didn't get mad, you know, but she would eat it. If it smelled a little, she said, no, I'm not eating that. So, so you know, I am a glutton. <laughs> Alex, did, did, did Julia have any guilty pleasures? Um, I, I, a la Jacques, I don't think she would ever say she felt guilty about yeah, it. Yeah, no guilt. Uh, but she did love a good burger. Um, mm. And oh, yeah. Jacques and Julia in their show do uh, an American style burger that he did and a French style burger that she did. They switched countries. Hmm. Um, and um, what is a French uh, style burger? Jacques? Yeah. Well, the style French burger she did, like, yeah, I remember doing that in France. Saute some onion, there'd be a bit of garlic with butter, then mix it into the meat, chop it together. It's a little bit like a, a type of meatloaf. Then you do patty and you saute the patty in a skillet with butter, pressing on it with a spatula. So, so it's a different type of thing. And it's interesting you said that because when she said, okay, let's do burgers. Said, what do you want to do burgers? She, in the show that we did, we always argue this way, one way or the other. And yeah. that was maybe one of the most successful shows that, that we did, you know? So yes, she was very, casual this way and uh, she loved working for for PBS as I do and uh, so we don't have to cow to to the sponsor in fact we don't even have the right to endorse a sponsor so that was great but sometimes she took it a bit far like the time when uh, we had the president of Lando Lake who came and uh, to to look at one of the show because we taped those show in uh, Julia's house in Cambridge there so uh, he telephoned, he said, can I come and look at one of the show? So uh, the, the, the producer, of course, told that, you know, the president of Land O'Leary is there. What are you going to do? It's not like Julia didn't use butter. I don't think I ever saw someone who did more butter than Julia. So I said, when I'm starting, I'm doing an apple tart. So I start doing a dough with apple and uh, slice it. And uh, Julia is going to help me. And that, just before we started, and Julia said, I want to do my own dough too. I said, terrific. So I did my dough. Uh, I rolled it. She helped me cut the, 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 uh, you know, the apple, butter, too. We put it into the oven. And now, and after that, I said, well, Julia is going to do her own dough now. And she said, yes, Jacques is going to do it. I said, OK. <laughs> she always did that. And she said, I want you to do it in the food processor. But that's a good idea. People did that. I said, OK, how much sure. flour you want? Like two cups, two cups a dash of sugar, a dash of salt. I say, how much butter do you want? She said, I want Crisco. I mean, there is oh. a fresh natural leg there. I said, what do you mean you want Crisco? We don't have Crisco. She said, we have Crisco. She had a can of Crisco underneath. So we did the dough with half Crisco and half butter. So I was talking with her. I said, you know, we don't have to call to the sponsor, but we really don't have to antagonize them. But <laughs> she was a rebel. She loved to it. Yeah. But that's essential, Julia, because not only was it very instructive, but it was also there was a there was a message there which was, you don't own me, you know, yeah. Land of Lakes, yeah. uh, and I think that's a, that was an interesting moment. It, it was funny, but it also had meaning to it, and, yeah. and it was instructive too yeah, because it, people it, did learn how to do it two ways. So yeah. exactly, it related to PBS, you know, PBS uh, again, even now in all the hundreds of show that there is on television, PBS maybe 
one of the only places where you teach something. I mean, uh, Lydia Bastianich or Rick Bellis or, uh, you know, teach, uh, which is not really common in the, in the show uh, that are, you know, television cooking show. Yeah. I'll add two more dishes that Julia liked, which mm -hmm. some people might consider guilty pleasures. Um, she loved Chinese food, uh, yeah. which she considered the second best after French. Uh, she and Paul lived in China uh, during the Second World War and came to really love the Chinese food. Um, she claimed she didn't like Italian food, but I certainly ate plenty of, you know, pasta meals with her over the years. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is that she always liked to serve goldfish crackers uh, as, a, as a little um, hors d'oeuvre uh, during cocktail hour. Um, and that became her signature dish. And I liked it because uh, when I was a little kid, we were allowed to eat what the grownups were eating, which was goldfish crackers. Uh, but we weren't drinking the martinis that they were drinking. So uh, it was a very uh, Julia thing because it was kind of down to earth, uh, but they're, they're kind of fun and delicious. Yeah, they, they are. And we have a ton of them here. And now I'll, I'll think of her when we, uh, when we eat them. That's great. We, we have a, a ton more amazing questions from the audience. Thank you for all your questions. And remember that you can add yours in the Q&A, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Q&A tab at the bottom. Um, but before we do that, uh, I want to just take a quick moment to introduce my colleague, Jamie. Hey, Jamie. Was that for me? She, I, 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 Here she is. Hi, everyone. Here I am. Uh, so we hope everyone at home is enjoying today's event. I know that I certainly am. And there's really, so, there's really something so special about a community of people brought together by legendary chef Julia Child, even after all these years. You know, GBH always strives to give audiences the best in entertainment. And the best way to give to GBH is by signing up as a sustaining member. Pick a monthly amount that works for you and your budget. It's automatically deducted from your bank account or charged to your credit card. And you can change the amount any time. I mean, what other monthly bills do you pay that are less than $10 per month and give you the value you get from GBH? Today, if you decide to give $6.25 a month as a GBH sustaining member, that's only $75 a year, you'll receive a copy of Julia Child's The French Chef Cookbook as a thank you gift. This classic book truly belongs in everyone's kitchen. And to make this offer even more impactful today, we are offering a two for one match up to $2,000 thanks to our generous GBH donors. That means if you pledge $75 today, one of our current donors will match it, raising your total contribution to $150. Please give $6.25 a month and we'll send you the French Chef Cookbook and the value of your contribution will be doubled. It's so easy to give. Please go to gbh.org slash support events, or you can click on that link you see in the chat right now and contribute what you can. You can also make a donation on your smart device, if that's easier, by texting GBH to 800-204-3811. That's 800-204-3811. Thanks so much for listening. And now back to Craig and our special guests with more. Great. Thank you so much, Jamie. And thank you to everybody who's supporting GBH. It makes it possible for us to do events like this and, and so many other great things that GBH does. So really, thank you. And you get that wonderful cookbook, too. So pretty great deal. So thanks, Jamie. Um, Want to jump back in with these questions here. Uh, Chris from Brookline uh, says, uh, Alex, I just finished reading My Life in France and, and absolutely loved it. And, and he said, Jacques, it's, it was wonderful to see you in that book as well. And he said, you know, it was, he's glad to hear that Julia embraced new kitchen tools. Um, and he wonders which of the new technologies do you think she would have embraced now and integrated in her cooking uh, the most uh, now? That's a tough one. She was, um, she called herself a knife freak, a frying pan freak. Uh, and she, you know, was basically addicted to kitchenware. Um, one of her favorite places on earth is a kitchenware store in Paris, which is still there. It's called De Hilleran. 
Uh, and she would go in there and she would always come out with an armload of gadgets. Hmm. And Paul would look in their cupboards in Cambridge and say, you know, we have enough gear in here to outfit at least two medium-sized restaurant kitchens. <laughs> and she said, I, I can't help myself. Uh, you know, she uh, was an early adopter of the, um, the cuisine art. Um, and out of that came a, a, an early Dan Aykroyd skit uh, called The Bassomatic, which I can Oh, yeah, The Bassomatic 76. On sure. SNL, yep. Mm -hmm. And um, then she also uh, would like the salad spinners that you pull and the thing would wheel around. Uh, uh, and she, uh, I remember she got one of the early microwaves um, and uh, she called it her NASA contraption. And I remember she said, it's a magical thing. You just put things in there and you hit this button and it all cooks. She said, I think we can do a whole meal. So apparently I wasn't there for this, but the story I heard, the legend is that she put a frozen chicken, some green beans, some potatoes uh, and some ice cream or something like that in the microwave and hit the button. At and the, the same thing time. Was shaking and smoking and chocolate sauce was coming out of the bottom and she opened it and it was just a disaster. <laughs> and, uh, after that, uh, she just used it to basically, uh, she said she uh, she used it to heat up a uh, water for coffee or something. And uh, one time she used the microwave to dry a wet newspaper and it, it lit the newspaper on fire. So don't use a microwave the way Julia did. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> don't try this at home, folks. Good uh, tip. But uh, today's things, you know, I, I, the Kitchen gear tends to be an evolution, not a revolution, really. So, for example, I uh, one of my favorite tools is the immersion blender, which mm. was starting to come on at the end of her life, but is now quite a, a popular tool in the kitchen. I think she would have loved that. It's great for making soups and um, smoothing things out. And um, but she also believed in hard work. She loved to. Uh, use a, a food mill, a muli, to make uh, homemade applesauce. And so yeah. we, this is a tradition in our family. And she liked the physical exercise of it. You know, she was a big, strong woman. And uh, she loved to spend hours uh, cooking and making things. And part of it was the physicality. Um, so I don't have a specific answer about what she would use today. I think she would try things out and collect yeah. a lot of gear. And, and, you know, who knows what she'd end up using at the end. I love that spirit of, of uh, adventure and trying new things that she had. Jacques, are, are, are there any new gadgets that you're into that you're trying out now? Well, I, I think that, yes, she was, she was very uh, pragmatic this way. If it worked, it worked, it was better. I mean, we used the food processor a great deal. Uh, one time we did a show where she wanted me to beat the egg white by hand and she was going to beat it with the machine to do uh, the difference, uh, which she started with, with a gun as we started the show to know which one would go faster. But certainly I would add all the stuff that uh, even I use now from, from non-stick uh, aluminum foil, yeah. uh, you know, and uh, well, rubber spatula existed, but when I was a kid, the plastic wrap, rubber spatula, non-stick aluminum foil, all that stuff makes your life easier without any question. And certainly the, the you know, the immersion blender and the blender itself, as well as the food processor, I mean, we do things in second now, which would take hours before to do yeah. a mousse of a, a mousse of chicken, where we have to pound the the, the 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 chicken or the fish. Often the fish we pound it with a with a what we call a mushroom, a wood mushroom through a very fine screen, you know, tummy, and then put it on ice and working with a spatula with ice and with the, with the cream on top eggs. I mean, to make a kernel or to make a mousse like that was a lot of work. Now you mm. put that in the food processor, in second, you have a mousse and she was absolutely for that. And I would say that probably Escoffier would have been very happy to use it as well, if it had been around at the time. But she, she was very open to any type of, uh, of new thing like that, no question about it. Jacques, yeah. Karen wants to know what kind of stuffing do you make? And this is a great question. Do you stuff the bird or not? Uh, I usually don't. Uh, I, I like to cook it on uh, to cook the the, the stuffing Inside. separate, and yeah. that's why I can control it more. It also depends what you have in your stuffing, you know. Like uh, when you stuff a chicken, if you stuff it often, I bone our chicken, stuff it with like spinach, ham, some bread, onion, garlic. Then you don't have to worry that much. There is no meat, but if you do it more in the style of a pate, uh, where you have ground pork, 
and all that, that it has to cook a certain amount of time, much more than the other type of stuffing. So, but usually I tend to have the stuffing on the side. I can control it more and uh, arrange my plates. Yeah, yeah. I've heard sort of both. I mean, it's great because it, you know, the stuffing, especially if it has bread, it absorbs all the juices and everything like that. But like, there's some concern around the, the temperature, right? That the, the turkey doesn't get enough temperature and it's probably soaking up juices that maybe, maybe it's not uh, safe. Alex, do you know, is, is it okay to stuff the, the turkey uh, in terms of just food safety? I think it's okay, but you make a good point uh, that the turkey will cook at a different rate than the yeah. stuffing. And so the stuffing can get kind of soggy at times and, and um, uh, it does impact the cooking of the bird. So I also cook my stuffing separately. Okay. Um, I think this year I'm gonna put leeks uh, in, in my stuffing and uh, try to kind of go uh, in that direction um, because it's just, for me, it's uh, that season, you know? Um, um, and, um, you know, Julia liked to put um, chestnuts sometimes in, mm, mm. Uh, which are good. Um, but uh, yeah, the one that, that, that I will never forget was the, the oyster stuffing, which I don't know if I could ever eat it again because I ate so much that <laughs> it took me a week to recover. <laughs> but I would, I would also add that when I cook a turkey, first I cut the end of the drumstick, you know, uh, before putting it in the oven so that when it cooked, the meat shrink and the tendon comes out. And one way of finding out whether it's cooked, you take a plier, you pull out those tendons. If they come out, first uh, the, the meat is better this way and you know it's cooked. The second thing that I do, uh, usually the breast is going to cook faster than, than the leg. So I cut between the thigh and the drumstick at the articulation. I cut with a knife about one inch deep. I do the same thing at the wing, at the corner of the wing. I mean, at the articulation of the wing and the breast, I cut a little bit so the heat can penetrate faster. Ah. So that like that, I don't have to cook it as long. And I know the red meat, you know, the, the dark meat will be cooked as well as the white meat about at the same time. You know, so. I love this thing about the the the, uh, the um, drumstick and the tendon. So you, you do a cut and then you cut it in between there and then you pull those all those tendons out because that's sort of the I, I love the drumstick, but I don't like all those tendons. You act, you before well, you serve it, you actually yank them out. Yeah, absolutely. When when yeah. you you look at your turkey in the oven, the meat will have shrunken, and those yeah. tendons stick out. So right. If you take a little plier, you pull it out. If they come out, you know that's cooked. You know so. That's a great one, tip. One, one year we did a. Um, a turkey where we, we separated all the pieces and cooked them separately. That takes some time, but it's a way of controlling the meat because as Jacques was saying, uh, the white meat cooks quicker um, and the red meat, the dark meat is, is richer. Um, and so that's maybe why you like the drumstick is because uh, it's yeah. a richer thing. Absolutely. And I'll never forget uh, as a kid uh, being kind of horrified and thrilled, but watching Julia pick up a giant, you know, Jurassic drumstick and just bite into it. It just, she just loved the drumstick. <laughs> so. Right. so, so like, I, I want to I drill down and really understand this point. So if I want to actually, if I'm doing it all at the same time, one way to actually make it so that the, the white meat doesn't dry out is to, to put some cuts in there so more of the heat can escape. Is that, do I have that right, Jacques? Yes, that's true. Also, the fact that very often when the turkey is three quarter cooked or even totally cooked, I turn it upside down and uh, leave it so that the moisture goes down in the breast rather than down the other way. I do that for chicken sometimes too. And you leave it like that for a while. So it keeps the moisture in the breast. That's a great tip too. We're getting good stuff. All right. This is, um, we, <laughs> these are tips that we can use for Thanksgiving. I love it. Um, Gail wants to know uh, from both of you, you know, is there any food you would never attempt to cook? A food that I never cooked? That, would you, that you just wouldn't try. You're like, you know, I'm not, that one, oh, so I, I'm uh, not even going to try it. Well, one time I was in China, one time I was in Vietnam, and for breakfast they gave me hot cooked eggs that I ordered. And I, when I cut it up, and those were fertilized eggs, 12 to 14 days. You know, the chick is born at 21 days, so 12, 14 days, the fetus was inside. So you had the whole fetus cooked into that egg, which I cooked, but I thought it was good, I ate it. But then a few months later, I was in China, and then I saw a line of people waiting at the market, so I always go to the market, and there was that, that big pile of eggs there where people with a light and people were looking, 
taking an egg, looking with the, through the light, and those again were fertilized eggs 12, 14 days. But at that point, they were cracking the egg, taking the fetus, dipping it in cork salt, and eating it like that. I couldn't do that one. <laughs> so, yeah, for some time. Yeah, understood, understood. Alex, any thoughts about anything that you just wouldn't even try yourself? Maybe, maybe that you would you would like, but wouldn't want to cook. Um, I would hesitate to um, to cook or eat uh, any animal that I would consider uh, keeping as a pet. Let me put it yeah. delicately like that. Uh, I'm a pretty Good adventurous rule. eater, um, and um, for better and for worse, sometimes I've gotten myself sick by trying things, but you know. I, I think uh, food is part of, of life and, and exploring it is, a, is an adventure. But, um, uh, you know, as a dog and cat lover, uh, I don't think uh, I would go that way. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you 100% on that. Uh, Kathleen from Seattle uh, wants to know what was Julia's favorite thing to cook, specifically from the Mastering the Art of French cooking book. So it sounds like she has this, this wonderful book and wants to cook one thing out of it that was, was her favorite. Well, again, it depends on the season. Uh, yeah. You know, Julia right, so never fall. had Let's just go a with the favorite. Fall. Yeah. So, you know, at this time of year, she would uh, she would cook a lot of poultry. But I think, you know, the classic dish for this time of year was uh, boeuf bourguignon, which sounds fancy, uh, but it's not. It's beef stew. Uh, it's just the French name for beef stew. And it's really pretty straightforward. Um, you know, th this is one of her most famous recipes, but for a reason. Um, it's delicious. Um, and, um, so, uh, if you just follow her instructions and, you know, don't deviate and don't skip, you know, steps, uh, it'll turn out beautifully. I promise you. Um, um, and the other thing would be a, a, a chicken stew of some kind. Um, uh, mm. so, um, but that, that book, you know, those recipes, uh, that book was published in 1961 and, uh, those recipes still hold up. Uh, yeah. They're still delicious and fun to make, um, and um, you can't go wrong. Yeah, and if you want to try those recipes, you should do it, because now you get to any type of French restaurant. You can never get a beef burgundy. You can never get a poulet chasseur, you know, a chicken chasseur sauté with the tomato. And, and You know, all of those dishes, for some weird reason, even some soup have, have disappeared. Even in a French restaurant, you cannot get it. So you have to do it yourself. <laughs> and you should for sure yeah. Jacques um, Mary Mary says she's just been a, a big fan of yours for, for many years and, and she wants to know when you would visit Julia in Boston what were some of your places to go out and eat and someone who lives in the greater Boston area I would very much like the answer to this question as well oh there were a couple of places that she, she liked but now you know my brain is he, good oh, what was that chef uh, she loved him and, well uh, Hammersley Gordon Hammersley's bistro Hammersley bistro he had what one but, and then uh, Jasper White uh, Jasper White okay Jasper White I went with her there 10 times uh, yeah. uh, yes she she loved the restaurant and you know she was always great when people go into into a restaurant where they ask us to come to the kitchen very often first thing Julia would go into the kitchen not only shake the air of the chef but go behind the, 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 the stove to shake the hand of everyone, including the dishwasher that we would do all the time, you know, and that people realized, you know, she was very, uh, she was very democratic this way, you know, in many ways. And, and I get you, it was, it was the graciousness that she always showed to, to everybody that really, that really shone through. Um, Pamela is at uh, BU, uh, which I know, Jacques, you know well. Um, uh, she says, wonderful collection of pans behind Jacques' head. Uh, which is your go-to? And what do you think of cast iron versus nonstick? Well, nonstick, I mean, for me, uh, nonstick is one of the greatest discovery. I mean, it already existed that because I remember working at the Plaza Athen in Paris in the 50s. Another, I had a special pan to make omelette, which was a steel pan, beautiful steel pan too, but I keep it in my closet. If someone took it to saute a piece of beef or something in it, that the whole thing has to be re-seasoned. So it was a big, big deal, you know, to, to, to have a pan that didn't stick to make omelette in the morning. I still have that pan against my wall here, my wall of pan is somewhere. I never use it. I don't use it because it's six, and it's six because it, I don't use it. <laughs> so yeah. I, you know, it's a vicious circle. But yes, yeah, certainly a uh, non-stick pan in, in many ways. I love a cast iron pan to, to roast. It's a different 
way of cooking roast something, you know, uh, uh, roast or thick piece of meat, you know, to get crystallization of the juice and so forth. Yes, I mean, we all have our favorite pan. It used to be that pan were pretty difficult to find. And now, you know, there is great, great pan on the market. As you see my wall here, and Julia had a wall of pan like that, because I think we both thought that uh, aesthetically, uh, those are very pleasing. So it's fine to be in a kitchen, but it's easy to grab it too, rather than trying to go into a cupboard underneath yeah. to try to find a pot. So those are, are there to be exposed. I have to say that I don't use much of the copper that I have on the wall anymore. I'm 85 years old, my shoulders are shut, and I cannot lift the, the copper pot, you know. So light pot, don't stick, that, that's good pot, yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, we have one last question uh, from Cynthia wants to know, uh, what did you like best about working with Julia? And, and both of you, you know, in your own ways, worked with her. I know Alex, you, you wrote with her and, and Jacques, you cooked with her. Um, what did you like best? The camaraderie. I mean, the point is that the, 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 uh, the anti-snobism, I mean, the very natural too, there, there was nothing fake, you know, about her people. We had a glass of wine, we took and people say, how is Julia out of, out of the camera? Exactly the same as she was on camera. Never change, you know, she was really planned forward. So, you know, to be together, to argue, to have a glass of wine together, to go out to dinner. And often she took me out to dinner in Chinese restaurant, actually in Boston, you know, because as Paul said, she loves Chinese food. So mm. yes, that, that kind of simplicity, that kind of honesty, that she had very straightforward. You knew exactly where you stand. And uh, so that was, uh, you know, a good friend. It's like cooking with a, with a very good friend. Yeah. Uh, with your spas or whatever. So, yes. Alex, what about writing with her? Well, um, I was lucky because I grew up with Julia in the family. So I knew her both as a celebrity on television, but also as a real flesh and blood person. And um, so I grew up hearing her and Paul's stories about France around the dinner table. Uh, and that's what inspired this memoir that I helped her write. Um, and, you know, as, as Jacques was saying, it was, um, it was instructive, it was fun, it was inspiring to spend time with her. It was never dull, I can tell you that. Um, and, and she really was the same person you saw on television in real life, even if it was just the two of us sitting in the room and we were working on the memoir together and we would, we would do some serious work and then we would start joking around and then we'd go have some lunch and then we go back to work and then uh, it, it was just a great sort of evolution. Um, and um, the other thing was, uh, it was a real privilege for me to work with her at the very end of her life. Uh, she was 91 years old and she was looking back on what she thought of as the favorite years of her life when she and Paul lived in France and she discovered cooking uh, and fell in love with France and its food and of course Paul. and. It's interesting how memory works because when we started talking early on, it was hard for her to remember. But then I began to read the letters that she and Paul had written to my grandparents out loud. And that was like the, the, the key that unlocked the memories. And then she started remembering these things and she would start talking about them in the, in the, in the present tense as if they were happening again. It was sort of mm. like watching a film unroll. And yeah. it gave her so much pleasure and it gave me pleasure. Um, and I learned that I always had to have a notebook with me wherever I went because she would remember something and then she would forget it. And so it was just fascinating to spend time with her at the end of her life. And, and, I, and I was just very lucky. Uh, and, 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 it was, and it was a great joy. Yeah, of course. Wow. Um, well, I just want to welcome uh, my colleague Jamie back for a moment. Uh, hey, Jamie. Hi, here I am. Hi, everybody. Once more, this was really such a phenomenal event. And we rely on financial support from members to, to keep making events like this possible. So again, if you're able to contribute $6.25 a month as a GBH sustaining member, you will receive a copy of Julia Child's The French Chef Cookbook, which is pictured behind me, as a thank you gift. And the value of your contribution will be doubled to $150 thanks to some very generous members out there. So please visit 
gbh.org slash support events to make a donation. You can also click that link you see in the chat to be brought to our donation site, or you can text GBH to 800-204-3811. Thank you for spending some time with us today. Um, moreover, thank you so much for your support. Bon appetit and have a happy holiday season, everyone. And now back to Craig. Great, Jamie, thank you so much. And I just wanna take a moment to thank both Jacques and Alex. <clears throat> it's just such a treat to speak with you. Uh, this has been wonderful and, and gotten uh, several tips that I will definitely incorporate into our Thanksgiving preparation for well, but it's, uh, and it's also so nice to hear all these wonderful stories about Julia. So thank you both so much uh, for, for joining us today and for supporting GBH with this event. Um, and, uh, and happy Thanksgiving to you both. Thank Thanks. you, Craig. Thank you. A super your PBS station, super GBH, and happy cookie. Yeah. Thanks so much. Bon Thanks appetit. so much. And thank you to everybody who joined us out there. I, I hope you all have a wonderful holiday season. And uh, also, don't forget to sign up for our uh, pie baking event, which is tomorrow. Uh, Ask the expert on pie baking. So uh, please join us for that as well. And again, happy holidays. <laughs>